Welcome back to Sunnybrae Baptist Church, or if this is your first time, welcome to Sunnybrae Baptist Church. We're happy that you could join us today, even though we're still not in person this week. New Brunswick is still orange phase for public health regulations, but even though we can't meet in person, we can still meet together online and share this experience together. Please join with us as we worship, and learn, and grow with one another at a distance at this time. Just one word, you come the storm that surrounds me. With just one word, the darkness has to retreat. With just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that a God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't know. Oh, praise the name that makes the way, there's nothing that a God can't do. With just one word, you heal what's broken inside. Just one word, you revive every dream. With just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. With just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that a God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't know. Oh, praise the name. salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with a sing.
we're going to continue in this series that we're in called I'm In. It's a four-part series. It's looking at who we are in Christ Jesus. And there's four themes to this. And each of those four themes has one word, and that word begins with the two letters, I-N. First week, we looked at I'm invited. Last week, we looked at I'm invaluable. And today, what we want to do is turn a little bit our attention to I'm influential. I'm influential. I know that many people here might not even think that they are influential, but let's kind of look at what this means. Now, if you were to type into Google who the top influencers are today, immediately you'll see that there's, there's all kinds of names that come up. And usually what it is, it's connected to Instagram or Facebook and how many followers people have, how many likes they get on certain things. As of today, the number one influencer in the world, according to Google, is Selena Gomez. She has over 135 million followers on her Instagram account. The second one is Cristiano Ronaldo, soccer player, with about 123, 124 million followers on his Instagram account. So I looked up what is an influencer. And the definition that you'll find if you look this up today says that it is somebody who has the power to affect purchasing decisions, the power to affect purchasing decisions of others based on their authority or knowledge or their relationship with the audience and primarily based on how many people follow them. So by this calculation, Selena Gomez is the number one influencer today. A lot of people may buy something simply because Selena Gomez may promote it on her Instagram. But I believe that we can change how we view influencers. See, I wonder how many of you at home today, as you're watching this, may think to yourself, well, I'm not an influencer at all. You may think, I don't have 135 million people following me on Instagram. I'm not even on Instagram. So how can I be an influencer? Well, I think influencers have a lot more to do with just how many followers they have on Facebook. I think there's, there's a lot more that comes into whether or not you influence people and the kind of impact that that can have in future events than just by how many followers you have on Instagram. I mean, I look back at my own life and there's so many people who have influenced me and, and you can ask the question, what is it that, what's the reason? Who influenced me to get to be where I am today in, in this role in Sunny Bray Baptist Church as a lead pastor here at the church? What influence, who influenced me along the way? You see, when I graduated from UMB with Bachelor of Physical Education and Recreation, I got hired on by the government of New Brunswick and I was working in trails and I had a plan. I wanted to be in park and recreation management for the rest of my life. That was, that's what I wanted to do. Along the way, I was working for the New Brunswick government, building trails, doing things I loved. And I got a call from a person who asked if I had heard about this place called Camp Shiktahawk who was looking for a director wasn't on my radar at all. But I ended up going to Camp Shiktahawk. While I was at Camp Shiktahawk, I had a call from another person, a guy named Bruce Fawcett, who some of you may know. And Bruce asked me if I'd ever considered going back to school and maybe doing some more education to go on to be perhaps a pastor someday. And I gave Bruce an answer that I had said many times in my life. I said, no, I'm not interested in that at all. I'm happy doing what I'm doing. But then, in the course of things that happened at Shiktahawk, I had to go around to different churches and I had to promote the camp. And I had told all of the pastors in the area that when I go to promote, I don't, I don't preach when I go, I'll simply promote the camp. It just was not something that I was comfortable with at all. But there was a new pastor who came in. He was pastor in the Grand Falls Ortonville area and he didn't know this. I hadn't communicated to him, so I had arranged to come up and do a camp promotion with the church. And I showed up on the Sunday morning and I read the bulletin. I was in shock. I was horrified. <laughs> it said that the message that day was going to be by Colin Cook. So I quickly grabbed my Bible, started skimming through and thinking, what in the world am I going to talk on? I ended up giving probably a short message where I probably looked terrified uh, about the Good Samaritan. And so I preached this sermon, 
And when I was done, this man who, to this day, I don't know his name. He was a man who you could kind of tell uh, probably he was an older gentleman. He probably wasn't all that popular with a lot of people in the church. But I finished my message. I was just about to go to prayer to move on. And I was just thankful that this was done. And all of a sudden, this elderly gentleman stands up and he says, excuse me, young man. And I began to tremble. <laughs> I had no idea what he was going to say. I knew this was my first ever sermon and I preached it very unprepared and I just didn't know what was coming. And he looked at me and he said, I want you to know that that may be the finest sermon I've ever heard preached. And immediately this, this sense of just relief came over me, but also this sense of, wow, did, God spoke through me today somehow. What influenced me to come into ministry? You could say maybe Bruce Fawcett did. You could say that that person who in, called me and told me about Camp Shiktahawk, that, that maybe they influenced me. You could say that this man who stood up in this service influenced me. But you can go back before that. I, I grew up in a family where my father was a pastor and obviously there was influences there. I married into a family where my father-in-law was a pastor and obviously there's influences there. When I was growing up, I, I went to youth group. My church had programs that, that happened at different times of the week. And in those years, there was these two men in the church, one named Lee, one named Roy. And those two men had a huge influence in my life. I don't know if they would even be able to tell you that today, but they had a huge influence in my life. They invested in me heavily over those years. And they've had a huge influence on my life. All kinds of people in all kinds of different situations. And in the end, I end up here today because people have influenced me. They have invested their gifts that God has given them. They have spoken to me what they believe God wanted them to say. And I'm thankful today that they did. Jesus speaks to his followers, and he says that he wants you to be an influencer. He says it in different words in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. He uses these two illustrations. He says that you are to be salt in the world. When you think about it now, what does salt do? Salt purifies, it preserves, and salt adds flavor. And he says, I want you to be salt in the world. I want you to be out there adding flavor to this world, good, positive flavor to this world. And he says, but you also need to be a light in this world. You need to be a light that shines in the darkness. He says, you need to be salt and light, and salt and light, light both influence what is around it. When you put salt on a meal, much the same today as it was 2,000 years ago, when you put salt on that meal, it will influence that meal in a certain way. Have you ever had maybe a, a bowl of soup that was made and the person who made it didn't want to use too many spices or anything like that because they, they weren't sure, you know, whoever's eating it, they may like it differently. And you get it and, and you think, well, that's, that's pretty good, but it needs something. And you just add some salt to it and all of a sudden that becomes so tasty. Salt influences the food that it touches. Light influences everything that it touches. You just need to compare driving at nighttime and driving at daytime. Light influences everything that it touches. And Jesus says we are to be salt and light in the world. But I think that maybe we think that we are just not quite good enough. Maybe sometimes we think that, who am I that I can be salt in the world? Who am I that I can be light in this world? Who am I that I can be an influencer in this world? I am not Selena Gomez. I don't have all the followers that she does. Who am I? I, I look, I'm, I, I stumble and I fall and I'm new to all this and, and I am just not qualified to be salt and light in this world. I'm not qualified to share Jesus with anybody. And sometimes we get thinking this and therefore we, we stop 
even trying to be an influence upon others. We stop thinking that we have something to share with others. Instead, we think that we just need to be quiet and allow maybe somebody else. You see, we even hear the word evangelism. And it conjures up these feelings within us. First off, when you hear the word evangelism, many of us want to think immediately, well, I'm certainly no Billy Graham. And, and that's okay. I am so thankful that we had somebody like a Billy Graham and many others before him who just changed so many people's lives through what God had gift them, gifted them to do and did an incredible job at it. And so some of us think, but I'm not that. And we think that that means I can't do it. Listen, I get up here and I preach every week and I am no Billy Graham. But I believe that God still will use the words that he gives me to influence people's lives. That is my hope and that is my prayer. That somehow the words that are spoken influence somebody else. Somehow the way that I live might influence somebody else. But we hear the word evangelism and we all of a sudden become scared because we're not Billy Graham. The other reason we become scared is because in today's day and age, the word evangelist is looked at so negatively. A few years ago, a book came out called The Day That America Told the Truth. The Day America Told the Truth. And in it, the author ranks 73 occupations from those that are most trusted to those that are least trusted. Televangelists rank 71st out of 73 occupations. Televangelists rank 71st out of 73 occupations. The most trusted being number one, the least trusted being number 73. There was only two that ranked below televangelists. Do you want to know those two? The two that ranked lower than televangelists were crime bosses and drug dealers. Everything else ranked higher than televangelists, including prostitutes. More trustworthy than televangelists, according to the study that they did in this book. And so we hear these things about evangelism, and these emotions can come to us that both us and people around us, and we think, I don't even want to be an evangelist. I, mean, I don't want to be viewed negatively like, like a televangelist is. I don't want to be viewed like that at all. And so we kind of shy away from it, and we become a whole lot less salty and a whole lot less shiny than we are called to be when Jesus says you are to be salt and light in this world. So what I want to do today is I want to look through scriptures at some people who I feel are some very unlikely evangelists. People who really, it's hard to believe that God could use them or would use them and did use them to be an evangelist to people around them. I want to look at a few different scenarios in the Bible. First, in John chapter 4, we're not going to read all this. In fact, we had a message on this very person not too long ago. Um, It's the woman at the well. The Samaritan woman at the well. Now, just for a little bit of background into the story, We know that this Samaritan woman comes out. She wants to draw water, but she sees Jesus there. And then there's this awkward moment as she realizes that she, a Samaritan woman, and he, a Jewish man, should not be together, shouldn't be seen together, and they certainly should not talk together. But Jesus opens the door and he has this conversation with her, and he ends up sharing life with her in their conversation. And and she's so excited about this. Now, before I get into what happens with her, I want you to understand a little bit about how this woman would have been viewed in her day and age. The very fact that we know her as a Samaritan woman. Did you know that Jewish men, in part of their daily ritual, many Jewish men each morning would pray and they would give thanks for several, several things. Three of the things that they would give thanks for, a Jewish man would pray, God, thank you that I am not a woman. God, thank you that I am not Samaritan. God, thank you that I am not a dog. God, thank you I'm not a woman. God, thank you I'm not a Samaritan. 
God, thank you, I'm not a dog. The Samaritan woman is two of the three things that Jewish men would think that they are not. She is not only a woman, she's not only Samaritan, she's also somebody who, as we find out in this story, has, has this very immoral lifestyle going on, and she would be shunned, unquestionably shunned in her community, by her choices and by who she is, she would be shunned. And yet, she leaves Jesus and she goes into the town, into the village where she's from, and she starts telling people about Jesus. And this is what we read in verse 39 of John chapter 4. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him, in Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. Many people in that town believed in Jesus because of this woman's testimony. Here is someone who is among the most unlikely evangelists in all of the world. And many believed in Jesus. You turn over just a few pages to John chapter 9. And here we have a story about a man who was born blind. And everybody in the community knew this man because every day they saw him. He had been blind from birth. And it was one of these just hopeless situations in so many ways. And Jesus heals him and he ends up uh, spitting in, in the ground, making some mud. And he puts it on the man's eyes and the man goes and washes it off and comes back and he's healed. And people start hearing about this. Some of the Pharisees, some of the teachers, they start hearing about this and they question the man. And he tells them, listen, hey, Jesus healed me. And the, the Pharisees try to make a big deal out of it because it was on a Sunday. But in the end, they come back to him. And I want to pick up at verse 24. John chapter 9, verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And I, this is just a man, born blind, would have been looked down upon his entire life. And he's talking with the Pharisees, the, the teachers, some of the, the lead people in the church. And he is sharing his experience with Jesus to them. And he's saying, do you also want to be his disciple? One of the least likely evangelists is out sharing about Jesus and what he can do. Then I want to go back to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, and we see here that there's a story of a man who is known for demon possession. He has demons in him. And as the story goes, Jesus interacts with this man, and in fact, with the demons that are in this man. And in fact, the demons, there's so many of them that they call themselves legion. And they interact with Jesus. And, and Jesus ends up casting the demons out of the man into some pigs. Those pigs run and they actually jump off a cliff into the water below and drown. And then we read this in verse 34 of this Luke chapter 8. When the herdsmen, the men who looked after the pigs, when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and, and they told it in the city and in the country. The, the men who saw what happened were so in shock, were so amazed by what they saw that they just had to go and tell everybody. In the city, in the country, it didn't matter who, it didn't matter where, they had to tell people what happened. And then people came out and they saw and people were afraid. They actually asked Jesus to leave. In verse 38 we read, The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. A man who people thought was crazy. A man who people were quite content to leave on a hill somewhere 
out on his own, looking and feeling and acting terrible, is now transformed into someone who is being salt and light in the city and sharing the love of God, sharing the amazing power of Jesus Christ in his life with them. Then we turn to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, I want to read to you a small portion from Acts chapter 9. It's about a man who was named Saul. This man who was named Saul who had truly made it his, his life's purpose to chase down and destroy Christians. To have them thrown in prison. He even was there at the stoning of certain other disciples. He made it his mission to destroy Christianity. And then he has an incredible interaction with Jesus. You can read about it in Acts chapter 9, but I want to pick up and read at verse 19. Halfway through verse 19, it says, For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And this is how unlikely it is that this same man is doing this because the reaction he gets in verse 21, all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man who was wreaking havoc in Jerusalem on those who would call upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? Unlikely evangelists. Some, like Paul, have gone on to do incredible works, uh, just amazing. Most of the Bible in the New Testament, over half of it written by this man, Paul. Missionary journeys that just would touch so many people. And others, so unlikely, but they just had to tell people what Jesus had done in their life. Church, it is easy to think to ourselves that we are not influencers. But here, throughout Scripture, we see that God used regular, ordinary, everyday, broken, sinful people to influence others for the gospel of Jesus. You see, you don't have to have your whole life all together. You don't have to have all the answers. There's so many times I've heard people say, if I, just, if I can just spend some more time studying and growing as a disciple, then one day I can become somebody who would share my faith. Imagine if the Samaritan woman said, now just let me follow Jesus for five years, and then I'll go and share what he's doing in my life. No, she ran off immediately. Church, just because you're not Selena Gomez and don't have 135 million followers on your Instagram, please do not underestimate the role that you can play in someone's life. And we don't know how that will play out down the road. We don't know what doing one encouraging act for someone. We don't know what sharing just one verse with somebody. We don't know exactly how our being salt and light in this world will impact one person, but then maybe several others from there. But I do know this, that when Jesus called his disciples, anyone who would come to follow after him, in Matthew chapter 4, he says, if you want to follow me, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will, I will help you to reach people for me. I will help you to be salt and light in this world. And I, I have to say, church, that too many times, we allow ourselves to think that we can't be influencers. We can't share a word. Maybe we're scared. Maybe we have too much pride. I don't know what all of the reasons are for you. I know what some of my own reasons are. But today, we need to reclaim who we are in Christ because we have been invited by him. We are invaluable to him, and we can be such incredible influencers for him. We have something. We have a gift. We have 
Christ Jesus been born to us and died for us, that we do not want to keep this to ourselves. We want to share this. We want to be salt and light in this world. And in this year, the year 2021, I believe that this world needs more salt and more light than it has needed in many, many years. People need to know about Jesus. They need to see you living a life that, that brings glory to him. And they need to hear you in some way. They need to hear you today telling them about the one who changed your life in the same way that the Samaritan woman, in the same way that the blind man, in the same way that the demon-possessed man went and told people what Jesus had done in their lives. People need to hear what Jesus is doing in yours. Will you today, will you agree and say, I need to be an influencer for Jesus in this world? Be salt, be light. Let's pray. Dear God, when we, when we think about the job of being influencers in this world, Sometimes it can be scary. Sometimes we think we don't know what to say, how to say it. We don't know what to do and how to do it. But truthfully, Lord, we just need to take that first step and say something and do something. Father, I'm thankful for the people in my own life who have influenced me from my own wife and children and parents and in-laws to people that sometimes I meet on the street and have a word for me that just means so much, to people who are leaders within our denomination, or sometimes to even the children who we serve here in programs, the way that they influence me because they're willing to be salt and light in this world. So, Father, I pray that you would help us, equip us, empower us, challenge us, push us. And, Lord, may we take that step to say that, yes, God, I want to influence people for you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail My God will never fail Cause my God will never fail And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory the battle belongs to you.
Thank you for joining us today. We trust that God will bless you. Now, again, I want to just encourage you to step out, be an influencer for Him this week. God bless you.